Savior. There is nothing like your freedom. Dancing in the hope of heaven. All my fears may do praise. All right, all I want. Come on now. All I want, more of you and less of me. And all I want, living. smile at somebody and tell them howdy, howdy, howdy. Oh, it's great to have you here. Glad you joined us for worship today. Right there where you're at, God is here to bless you today. God is here to hear your heart, hear your pain. He's here to heal all the areas of your life that you need from him today. All he wants you to do is come and just, just allow him to fill your place, this place with his presence. Can we just close our eyes? Father God, we're here. We thank you for this opportunity to come. So now, God, would you just fill us with your presence today? Whatever struggle, whatever heartache, whatever challenge we faced this past week, Lord, right now we come to you. We ask you, God, to bless us, to watch over us, to give us your strength. Lord, bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Say it again. Lord, bless you 
May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.
you are for us today. And as your word says, if you are for us, then no one or nothing can be against us. That you have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, you have overcome. So God, no matter what we go through in life, no matter how hard life may feel, you're the one who overcomes. So we sing these words, amen, today as a declaration, as a stamp of saying, yes, it is done. So shall it be. That's what we say today. So whatever you need from him today, as we sing this again, just sing it and proclaim it out loud that God's got you. Sing it right now.
Thank you for your precious name that heals, your name that restores, that God, even when we may not feel like it, even whenever life is tough, even when the doctors are poor and the phone call has come in and it's shocking to us. Lord, it's in those times that you still want us to praise you. It's in those times you still want us to bless you. It's in those times that we cry out to the one who can do the impossible. So, Lord, today, for those here in this place that are struggling, for those here in this place today who need a miracle, for those in this place today that, God, maybe they came in with heaviness on their hearts or heaviness on their souls, God, right here, right now, may they know that, God, you are their source. You're their hope. You're their strength. You're the one who comes in the darkest of times and says, I'm here trust me, walk with me, I will hold you, and I will be there with you. So God, for every life here, may you touch them, may you strengthen them, may you let them know that God, they're not alone. You're the one that comes alongside us in our times of struggles and needs. Thank you, God, for your blessing today. May you just watch over us today. Let your word speak life in the next few moments of time, we pray. In Jesus' name, everybody said, If you have your Bibles, open them up today. We're going to look at uh, Proverbs 20 in just a second. But as you're turning there, um, we're doing this series called uh, Cancel, Cancel Culture. Um, we live in a world that's full of cancel this, cancel that. They don't like what you have to say, so cancel you. And unfortunately, it really targets conservatives targets Christians um, when they don't like what we had to say or whenever we stand up for something or we say, no, I'm not going to go down that road. Um, they tend to kind of be like, okay, we'll cancel. We're canceling you. We're canceling whatever it may be. I just saw this past week of, a, of an organization that was canceled uh, because they took a stand against transgender um, and they were canceled. And this was not even a, a Christian organization. It was just an organization that said, no, we're not going to go that way. And so there's this canceling that goes on all around us. And we as Christians need to learn how to be bold, how to be strong, how to stand up against it. Because if we don't speak, if we don't stand up, if not in a violent way, not in a, not in a confrontational way, but just take our stand and stand firm in what we believe, we will be pushed around and we will be told what to say and do. Good preaching right there. It's happening everywhere. And we as a church, we as a body of believers need to understand that we live in a day and time that you cannot afford to be silent. You cannot sit passively by and be like, well, whatever, whatever, whatever. Okay? Because we live in this age of perpetual, I said this the first week, perpetual offense where everybody's offended about something. Just trust me, you're going to offend somebody when you take a stand and when you stand up for what's right or you stand against something, you will offend people because we live in this coddle, soft, feather-like, snowflake generation that can't handle anything. Now, I know, I want you to know, some people say, well, you're preaching from a platform. No, I'm talking from when, why can't we just handle the fact that people disagree with us? I, 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 we can handle the fact that people disagree with us, but that's not a right today. They don't, want, they don't want you to disagree. They want you to convince you you're wrong and they're right. The agenda is no longer, 
okay, you're right to have your own opinion. It is, I will bully you until you believe and see it the way I see it. And I will, I will start to restrict you and I'll start to take your freedoms away until you see it the way I see it. Where are we living at, people? Right? We're not living in a free place. We're living in a place of, of, of constant every day. We have to fight for our freedom. Used to you fought for your freedoms abroad. Now we're fighting our freedoms on the home front. And this is what this cancel culture is all about. It's about, I don't like what you say, so I'll cancel you out. So our first week, we learned about how to show honor in a cancel culture world. How do we show honor in a world that says, well, I don't, I don't really know who you are, and I don't really care what you are, but I'm going to cancel you anyway. I said, there's, we're going to honor three areas. We're going to honor our, our parents, regardless of how you think they did as parents. We're going to honor them in the, in the place in the office that is the parents, we're going to honor our authorities, our first, our, our officers, our fire people, the people that handle our, our, our first responders, our nurses, our doctors. We're going to honor. We're going to honor. We're going to honor our mayors and our civil leaders, and we're going to honor the office of the president of the United States. Crickets. <laughs> Not the person. The office. If, if we would just as Christians and as Christ followers get this through our head, we honor the office, the, we, we, we honor what the office and the authority that it has, but we, we don't do that. We put the person in there all the time. And so we have to honor, show honor to that authority, show honor to the church authority, show honor to our church leaders, to our teachers downstairs, show honor to them. And I talked about how we can do that in my very first week. Last week, we talked about in a cancel culture world, integrity is like non-existent. It's like no one really says, no one really does what they say they're going to do. And if they do, it's always crooked. There's always evil and corruption. And I talked last week about how integrity um, is what your public life is and how it lines up with your private life. They have to be two as one. That who you are inside your home must be represented to who you are inside the world. If you don't swear and cuss in church, then you shouldn't be swearing and cussing inside your home. Right? Y'all hear me now? If you're not going to gossip about somebody in church, you probably shouldn't gossip about somebody in your home. It's, it's integrity. It's who we are behind closed doors and who we are in public. And then today, um, how many guys would be just very real and honest with me today by a show of hands? How many guys would agree that we live in, a, in, a, in this cancel culture, this culture of consistent disloyalty? There's a lot of disloyalty. How many would agree that we live in a culture of disloyalty? Yeah, right, the hands. It's, it's true. We, we really live in this disloyal world where people are not loyal to anyone or anything. It's just a breakdown of loyalty that continually goes on. And, and today I want to talk with you about how we can cancel what cancel culture is doing with loyalty. And we can find ourselves at a place of being loyal even when the world is not. Here's the thing. All of us raise our hands and agree that we live in a, a society of consistent disloyalty. We see it all around. We see it through social media. We see it all over the news. We see disloyalty. We see disloyalty with friends and family, unfollow, unfollow. I'm not going to pay attention to them. I'm going to be disloyal to them. We see it play out in our society with, with uh, restaurants. We see disloyalty with, with places you shop, disloyalty with brand, name brand things, disloyalty inside the home, disloyalty in all different areas. Um, but what's interesting is I know what all of you are doing right now. You're looking around. I'm looking around. I look around here, and you know what? I don't, see, I don't see any disloyal people here. I see very loyal people. And that only means one thing. I mean, when you look around, it only means one thing. All the disloyal people go to other churches in this town. <laughs> they don't come here to Crossview, right? Because I look around. I mean, look around you. Look around. You look at them. Come on, look at, the, look at your neighbor. Don't look at your spouse because that may not work. But look at somebody. The, you know, just with loyal people, right? They must attend someplace else in town. Because I look around, I see lots of loyal people. But here's the problem. Here's the grind. Here's the, here's the, here's the issue. Write this down in your notes. Disloyalty cannot be seen in a mirror. None of us really in this place. In fact, I would think all of you would say, I'm a pretty loyal person. In fact, all of you probably would say that. 
There's nobody in here that's going to say, no, I'm really disloyal. I'm really a bad, disloyal person. We're all going to be like, I'm a pretty loyal person. I'm, I'm pretty loyal to, to my family and my friends. I, I'm pretty loyal. But if I get disloyal, if I am disloyal, it's because they deserved it. Are you all with me? See, because disloyalty is hard to see in the mirror, that means you can be loyal to someone until they did something or to something until they have it's let you down somewhere, and then you have a right to be disloyal. You have a right to check them off. Yeah, well, you don't understand, Pastor Kevin. I am justified in my disloyalty. Think about it in your own life. Just take a moment. Think about it. Who or what have you been disloyal to? And how did you justify it? More than likely, you justified it because they had said something or done something that have offended you. They had maybe, uh, maybe they posted something, or maybe they didn't like something, or they didn't tag something, or maybe, maybe they didn't comment on your post. Well, I'll show them I'm not going to comment on their post. They forget my birthday every year, <laughs> right? I get the day late birthday. I get the belated birthday wishes. Some friend they are. See, we can't see disloyalty in the mirror. But yet, if we're being honest today, all of us struggle with disloyalty. All of us wrestle with being loyal in the times that it really hurts. Don't believe me? Here's a New Testament story. Um, New Testament story is about a man named Peter. It's found in Matthew 26, verse 33. We're going to read that in just a moment. Peter, who was like Jesus' right-hand man, like he was the dude, man. Jesus, he was the guy that walked on the water. When no one other, none of his other disciples did, Peter walked out on the water, kept his eyes on Christ, and all he did, he walked on water. When he turned away, he started to sink. Peter, or Jesus picked him up. And told him, hey, have faith, and they went on. Peter was a great, great friend to Jesus, and he believed he was a great friend. And he saw himself as a loyal friend. In fact, this is what he said. Read this. Peter replied to Jesus. Jesus was talking this at the Last Supper, and uh, at, at the final time, Jesus was going to be with him. He's saying, all you guys are going to be scattered. All you're going to leave me. You're going to be disloyal. You're going to abandon me. You're going to totally leave me. And Peter says, what do he say? He says, even if what? Even if all, even if how many? If all. all fall away on the account of you, what? Say it with me. I will never. <laughs> I'll never do it. I never will. I'm with you, Jesus. We're bros to the end. Do or die. We're there, man. I'm with you, Jesus. And Jesus says, uh, well, Peter. Before morning comes, you're going to not just do, not be disloyal to me once, but you're going to do it three times before the morning rolls around. But Peter declared, even if I what? Have to die, I will never disown you. I will never be disloyal to you, Jesus, because I am with you. Bow your heads today. Father, help us today to search our own hearts, our own minds, our own actions, that, God, we would survey our loyalty, that we would evaluate this, this culture that tries to say loyalty is no big deal. Loyalty is huge, God. Loyalty determines who can be counted on when life is the hardest. Loyalty is an eternal thing that makes a difference in our lives. So, Lord, help us today to see and survey where maybe we are disloyal, and God, you can help us be completely loyal in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Put that verse back up there if you guys would. Here's what it says. Jesus says, you're going to disown me not once, not twice, but three times. And Peter says, nope, I will never disown you. Be careful when you say never. Never say never. Because the fact is, disloyalty creeps its way in and justification comes all along uh what happened in this particular story is as it went on jesus was arrested he was taken away and as he was taken away the night began to go on it was a chilly night jesus uh peter followed jesus from a distance kept him in a, in a kind of a, a, a far-reaching eye zone that he could see him 
He goes and warms himself by a fire. And a group of people said, hey, weren't you the one that was with that Jesus? That, that so-called king? And, he, and, G, and Peter said, no, that wasn't me. He goes on a little bit further, and he gets with another crowd. And they say, weren't you the guy that was with him? He's like, no, 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 that was not me. I don't even know that guy, right? Disloyalty number two. He goes on even further, and it says that as he warned by a campfire, a little girl, a little girl came up to him and says, hey, you're one of his. You're one of his followers. You were with that Jesus. And Peter got so irate and so disloyal, it says that he raged, and he even swore that he had nothing to do with Jesus. Why? Because Peter could not see disloyalty looking in the mirror. And this is the challenge for us today. This is the hard part for all of us today. We can't see disloyalty in the mirror, but the problem is all of us at some point in our life, we've been disloyal to someone at some point at some place in time. Every one of us. We have either talked about someone or said something or gossiped about someone. We have uh, talked bad about someone. We let our souls become bitter with a situation, and we find ourselves at a place of disloyalty. Why? Because loyalty cannot be seen in the mirror, but my... The second thought is this, true loyalty is proven, not proclaimed. Peter proclaimed he never would reject Jesus, but his actions said otherwise. Y'all hearing me today? This is good stuff. Hope you're getting it. I'll tell you it's good stuff, even if you don't believe it, it's good. Loyalty is proven, not proclaimed. Here's what Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6 says. It says, many will say that we are loyal friends, but who can find one who is truly reliable? In fact, that word loyalty can translate from the Greek to amen, which is what we say at the end of our prayers. It is, we say amen because it is I trust in the one I just prayed to, and so shall it be because he is always loyal to me. See, in a full, world full of disposable, wavering, faltering relationships, loyalty is a forgotten place, a forgotten virtue that every single one of us should exemplify as Christians. Not just talk the talk, but walk the walk. Not just say we're loyal, but prove we're loyal by how we behave. Now, let me give you a story that's going to kind of finish up this, kind of take us home. Story is a man named King David. Let me tell you kind of the backstory here about King David. King David was not a perfect man. In fact, he had many falters and many things that he did that were not quite right. But King David uh, had a son named Absalom. Absalom was a good-looking arrogant son. He was a son that really had a lot going for him, but he did some really stupid things. Uh, killed a person, uh, did some other horrible things, and actually was chased out of the city and was like banned from the nation of Israel, David's own son. But the whole time he's gone, David hurts for his son. David was loyal to his son. David missed his son because you can't disown a son. It was his son, and so he was troubled by this. And David continued to hope for his son to come back. Well, three years later, Absalom goes off into the desert. He takes some of the, some of the military people from David's army and recruits some other people. And all of a sudden, three years later, guess what? Absalom comes back to David. But he didn't come back to make up with dad. He came back to take over David's kingdom, to overthrow his own father as king. Now, David could have done a lot of things. He could have, no way, and he could have sent off all of his military and totally annihilated Absalom. But you know what he did? David instead, he ran. He wasn't going to fight his own son for the kingdom. So he runs, and he takes about 600 men with him. And this is what loyalty truly is. Uh, there was a, uh, the king said, this is King David, to one of the guys that went with him, he said to King, he's, uh, King David said, it tight, the get tight. It tie the get tight. Say that with me. It tied the get tight. It ties his name. Get tight is his origin. Okay. It tight, get tight was like a mercenary. He was a he was a warrior for hire, and he came 
and he joined with David to fight against his son Absalom. But Ittai the Gittite, King David says to him, hey, 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 why you come with me? Hey, you don't have to come. Go back to King Absalom. He's basically telling you, listen, don't be disloyal to King Absalom. Fight for him. Don't fight for me. I'll be fine. He's basically still being loyal. Even at this time, he's still being loyal to his son. And, and he says, go back to Absalom. You are a foreigner in exile in your home, from your homeland. You, come, you came only yesterday. You come only yesterday. Go back. Take your countrymen. Uh, may your kindness and faithfulness go with you. So here's Ittai. Ittai says, I'm going with King David. I'm going to fight for King David. King David never offered him money. He never hired him. In fact, Absalom hired Ittai. And Ittai was like, nope, something's not quite right. I don't know what's going on, but something's not quite right. And Ittai says, I'm going to go, and I'm going to fight with David. So David says, Adam, go home. Go away from me. Go fight for Absalom. I, you, you don't even belong with us. It's fine. Go back. But here's what Ittai says. This is, this is loyalty. This is loyalty to someone he's only known for one day. Here's what he says. Ittai replied to the king, as surely as the Lord lives... And as my Lord, the king, lives, talking about David, he says, whoever my Lord, the king, may be, whether it means life or death, there your servant will be. One day, this guy proved loyalty. He didn't proclaim it. He proved it by leaving everything behind and going and fighting for King David. I'm going to fight for you. Loyalty is proven not proclaimed. Loyalty is proven, not proclaimed. Where do we see this in short supply in our world today? Loyalty. Loyalty. Think about your friends. Think about, you know, you, you think about your Facebook friends, but it's, they're fake anyway, so don't think about it. Think about your friends, like the people you do life with. Whenever life gets tough, do they, do they back you? They may not agree with you, but are they there for you? And you stand loyal and unified. This is what I want to talk about. So I want to give you three areas to be loyal in. Three opportunities in your life that you can be loyal to people in your life. First one is loyal to your family. Ephesians 5, chapter, 20, uh, chapter 5, verse 22 to 27. Here's what it says. It says, wives, submit to your hu own husbands as, uh, as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head uh, of, the, of the church, uh, his body and of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to your husband. Now, I know what some of you are saying out there. Oh, boy. Pastor Kevin, you're going against my... I'm a, I'm a liberated woman. I don't need no man. I don't need no man. I'm not, I'm not telling you how to have a man. I'm not saying... What I'm saying is, in a, in a marriage home, in a marital home, if the husband has stepped up to be the spiritual leader of your home... That means he is walking with Christ and he is making spirit-filled decisions. That means uh, he's praying for your family. He's praying for direction if you have a big decision coming up. The wife is, if the husband is praying and saying, hey, I feel like this is where God has taken us, then wives, your responsibility, your response is to submit. Now listen, the minute we hear that in our, in our English world, we get upset. Because I, we think of like crawling on the ground and licking his feet. <laughs> and while Michelle does that, that's okay. But not everybody has to do that. <laughs> we, we think of submission. We think of this, oh, king, he comes in. And oh, your home, oh, Lord, come and sit in your crown of recliner and sit and watch TV. What else would you like? Oh, you want grapes fed to you and feathered and no no no, it's not that's, that's not even that's not even the proper definition of submission. See, we've twisted it in our English world in our American culture. That's not at all what it says. Submission in this context, it actually means to hold up. So wives, hold up your husbands. As he holds up under Christ, and as you move forward, you'll find there to be loyalty and honor. It says, goes on to say, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. 
uh, and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle. Some of you women say amen. No stain or wrinkles. No wrinkles. Amen. amen. All right. Or any other blemish but holy and blameless. This is what Paul is challenging. He says, listen, wives, be loyal to your husbands and submit. Hold them up. Husbands, loyal to Christ. Hold, he, he, you, you don't hold Christ up, but he holds you up. And as you two mutually submit, you'll see this beautiful, beautiful thing that comes out. See, disloyalty is hard to see in a mirror. Husbands, speak to wives encouraging. Wives, that means that when you get with your girlfriends and you're frustrated with your you know, your husband or, you know, your significant other, you don't get and bash him and slam him and say he's so stupid. And then he comes around, oh, honey, you're the best. You don't do that. You, 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 you encourage husbands. You don't speak filthy uh, about other women to other, to other uh, guys. You, you submit and you are loyal. Children, you're loyal to your parents. You don't look at them like they're some idiots trying to raise you because guess what? You're the problem. Right, parents? All the parents in the house? All right, that's right. They're the problem. They're the problem. Employers, employers, be loyal to your employees. Don't talk about them. Don't gossip behind their back so they find out and it brings a rift inside your workplace. Employees, be loyal to your bosses. Don't talk about them. Don't gossip behind their back. Don't cheat them. Be loyal to them. This is the mutual submission. Mutual submission means holding each other up in a Christ-like way. So we're going to be loyal to our family. Second thing is be loyal to your friends. Be loyal to your friends. National survey was taken. It was asked on Americans on a national average. How many friends do men have? One, maybe two, depends on the day, depends on the time. Women, on an average, how many, how many girlfriends do you have? 20 to 30. Sometimes really just four, depends on how much I'm fighting with the 20 or 30. <laughs> that's just a joke. I, that's not really a statistic. Don't go home and quote that to anybody because I made that up. The fact is we're going to be loyal to friends. Here's what Proverbs 17, 17 says. A friend is always loyal, and a brother who is born in the help of time of need, a uh, brother born of adversity. That means whenever the times are struggling, there is someone that will be there no matter what. The great thing about friends is friends can handle hard conversations. Friends can handle tough communication. Friends can handle even moments where you're not happy with them. They're not happy with you, but you somehow come around, you make it back to a place of communicating and being a friend once again. If we can keep our ego out of the way, if we keep our selfishness out of the way, we can have great relationships with other people. But the ways to be disloyal in friendships is to gossip about them, to talk about them, to, to on Facebook, to, uh, to see something and to, um, you know, you know I don't, I'm not a big Facebook person because, like, I don't even like the thing. I think it's just caused more division. It's just a braggadocious way for people to brag their filtered life. It's not real. It's not real, people. It's not real, okay? It's not real. You say, well, you don't know. I post real. No, you don't. You take 12 pictures before you post the right one, right? <laughs> We're all filtered. We live in a filtered world. But we listen to each other. Um, we tell them the truth whenever the truth needs to be told. We say, hey. I disagree with you on that, but that's okay that I disagree with you. I just disagree with you. I have great friends in my life, friends that are for adversity, friends that I can call up no time, any time of the day, no matter what it is, no matter what time it is. I have great friends that I can call up and say, hey, I'm struggling in this area. And they will not say, well, it's your fault. They will say, how can I pray with you? How can I be there for you? A loyal friend is someone that's there no matter what you want. But before you can have a loyal friend, you must become a loyal friend. That means even whenever they said things and done things that have hurt you, you overlook it and you move on. You go, you know what? 
I'm not going to let my ego get in the way. I'm going to forgive. I'm going to say, God, help me to be loyal, even if disloyalty was shown to me. So we're going to be faithful, uh, loyal to our friends, loyal to our family. Last one is loyal to Christ's church. We're going to be loyal to the church of Christ. In the New Testament, there were some Jesus freaks going on in that New Testament church. They were nuts, man. They were literally crazy about who Christ was and what he did. And they practiced church in a radical way. Like, they were so on fire for God. They were so in love with just being people who came together and did life together. And they were so loyal to each other that here's what they did. Look, at, look with me. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to the prayer, prayer for each other. The Bible says they devoted themselves, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, breaking the bread and prayer, and all the believers were together. And what did they have? They had everything in common. They did life together. This is why these view groups that you've been hearing about for the last two months are so important. View groups are places where people get to get outside. Like right now, look, look what's in front of you. Just look what's right in front of you. Don't turn your head. Look, what is that in front of you? The back of somebody's head, right? You're looking at the back of somebody's head. You don't know that person. You may know them, but you don't know them. And that's what view groups are. That's what they're all about. They're about coming together and doing life together, the ugly life, the good life, the hard life, the hurtful life, but the blessing life. And we pray together. And it says that every day they continue to meet together and they continue to do life together. The early church, they said, we are in this thing. If we're going to survive, and this is true for today, if we're going to survive as a Christian community, I'm not talking cross you. I'm talking Christianity at large. Then we better come together and stop fighting among ourselves. Preach it, Pastor Kevin. That's right on. We have to stop being, being upset because they don't see the way we see it or they don't do it. The only thing that matters, the only thing that matters in the kingdom of God is Christ crucified and his resurrection. That's the only thing that matters. And one day, if we know Christ and we accept him, we will live for him, with him forever in heaven. That's the only thing that matters. Your political view does not matter. Your, your point of vax and unvax and mask and no mask does not matter to the kingdom of God. But we try to make it all about that. And it's been so divisive. Now, hmm, hmm, who, who would be the, the facilitator of division? Who's the author of chaos? Who lies to us every day? Hello? Y'all hearing me? If it causes division, it's of evil. It's evil. It's of the devil. It's a lie. Christ crucified. Paul said this. Paul said, the only thing that matters is Christ crucified and his resurrection. That's all that matters. I don't have to, you know, people always like, well, what do you think? What do you think about, uh, you know, the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit? Hey, man, the more spirit, the more power. Thank God for it. Well, I disagree with that. Okay, that's all right. I don't care. Go ahead. What do you think about what do you think about uh, if the scripture is completely accurate? I believe it's 100% accurate without any flaws whatsoever. I believe that. Well, I disagree with that. Okay. I ain't going to argue with you about it. I'm not going to try to convince you. That's for, that's for you to believe. I don't really care what you believe as far as that. What I care is Christ crucified and his resurrection to the glory of God, to his surpassing glory. So we're loyal to Christ's church. We're loyal to what he calls us to do. Disloyalty, we can't see in the mirror. The problem is loyalty is proven, not proclaimed. Where does disloyalty come from? Can I give you this? This is the last point I want to give you. Disloyalty is born out of a divided heart. Disloyalty is born out of a divided heart. 2 Timothy 2.13, even when we are faithless, disloyal, he remains faithful or loyal to us when we don't show him love 
he still shows his love to us. We get unified heart by submitting our hearts to God. James chapter 4, verse 8 and 9 says it this way. It says, come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinner, purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter, gloom instead of joy. Why? Because you have been disloyalty, but I am asking you to come back. Only God can take our divided heart and make it one again. Bow your heads with me today. Father God, help us today in our disloyalty to find loyalty to you. In a world, in a world that is so divided, in a world that is always struggling to show loyalty. God, and when the world is pressing in around us, whenever culture is saying, this is what you do, this is how you need to act, this is, this is what loyalty looks like, God, but it doesn't look like what you look like. That God, even whenever, we're, even whenever we're hurt, even when we're disloyal or talked about, God, we remain loyal. We remain loyal to you, God, first and foremost, and loyal to our family and loyal to our friends. Right there where you're at, help survey us, God. Survey us. Challenge us today. God, you would be the one that surrounds us and teaches us what loyalty is like. Just like with David, God, he was loyal to, loyal to someone who hurt his heart, and yet he loyal to him. Thank you, God, that you are our example. Right there where you're at, with your head bowed and eyes closed. Maybe there's someone that you may be in this message today. Maybe there's someone, first off, that has been disloyal to you. Maybe they've talked about you, or maybe they've said things about you, maybe even posted things about you, but it's been untrue. That disloyalty cuts deep inside of you. And so the first thing I want to pray for today is for those of you who have been betrayed by disloyalty, I'm going to ask God to heal your heart of that. I'm going to ask God to help you. For those of you who have been betrayed by a spouse, by a family member, maybe by a friend, a co-worker, if you know who they are, just right there where you're at, just bow your heads and just say, God, help me to forgive to find healing from this betrayal and this disloyalty that has taken place. Say, God, I need you to help me. Heal me. Heal me. Others of you here today, you've been disloyal to somebody. You've said things or done things, and maybe today the Holy Spirit is prompting you and saying, you know what, some of you may have to make a, a phone call or write a letter or maybe a conversation, a hard conversation has got to be made of asking for forgiveness and there to be restoration and there to be healing. Right there where you're at, if that's you, just bow your head. Just think about that person, that person you need to be asking for forgiveness, that person that you have been disloyal to, that person that you have spoken about or said things about. Right there where you're at, just say, God, help me to learn how to be loyal and prove my loyalty no matter what. Thank you, God, that even when we are faithless, even when we are disloyal, that Jesus, you come and you prove your loyalty over and over and over again. You tell me time and time again, I'm here. I'm yours. says, you know, I see who you are, and I know what you can be. I love you, and I'm here for you. Some of you, someone here today, that's for you. God loves you, and even though you've been disloyal to God, he wants you to know he still loves you. He's never given up on you. Like I'm 
surrounded by, no matter how disloyal people are around us, no matter where people sway or where people uh, kind of move to, God, we're going to be loyal to you. We're going to be loyal to those around us, God. The world is full of disloyalty, but God, let us be a church. Let us be a people that show what loyalty is, no matter what the pressure is, God. I pray that, Lord, you'll watch over us, keep us in your hands, and teach us every day what true loyalty looks like in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day. We'll see you next Sunday.